There you are. Good. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for joining our webinar this afternoon. Now, before we start, we should check something because proving that you should always expect the unexpected. Emma, your internet was cut off by Workman in the Road, wasn't it, about an hour ago? Yes. And how is it now? It came on again two minutes ago, so hopefully this will be OK. Fantastic. Well, it was going to be a real shame if we couldn't do this as well as we wanted to, because Emma and I had some training a couple of months ago on presentation, and this is our first test run as to that training. So let me just tell you some of the things they told us. First of all, be yourself, only 20% more. So a few of you who know, who know me well can make an assessment of that. Second, and rather depressingly, apparently no one listens for more than 18 minutes. I'm sure you're all familiar with TED Talks. They're 18 minutes long. There's a reason for that. Apparently, people zone out after that. So we think we've got around that by doing, we think, about 18 minutes each. I hope that's um, legitimate. Thirdly, apparently you're all going to forget 56% of what we say within the next hour. So uh, let's hope we can get around that one too. And fourthly, and most depressingly, if you're giving a talk like this, you're meant to spend an hour preparing for each minute of talk. So we welcome your feedback. Let's hope that I'm myself plus 20%. I'm sure Emma's going to be. Do let us know how you think we've got on. Okay, scope of duty, the forgotten ingredient. Why the forgotten ingredient? Well, Emma and I think this is just something that as we go through our normal run of daily practice, it's something we forget about. We don't often consider scope of duty. We just tend to think duty of care, loss are the two linked. So what we're going to try and do is delve deeper into this so that we can really get a grip on what the law says. Now, stop getting it wrong. Who said that? Well, recently, the case we're going to tell you about today, Khan and Meadows, it was the Supreme Court. Um, if you read the judgments, and there are seven of them in Khan and Meadows, you'll sense, I think, a slight disappointment among the Supreme Court justices that almost 90 years to the day after Donoghue and Stevenson and the snail in the ginger beer bottle, we are still getting duty of care and recoverability wrong. So uh, the idea of this talk, of course, is to make us get it right. Incidentally, that picture, I think it's so bad, it's good, and it is for sale. Albion Chambers in Bristol have just had a refit and they're advertising that for sale. It's life-size. I must say I'd buy it if I had room for it. So if anybody wants it, um, please get in touch with Albion Chambers. What is scope of duty? Well, a good place to start with any fundamental legal question is Lord Denning. Let's see how he put the scope of this question. Person should be liable within reason for the consequences of his conduct. Now, when we're dealing with negligence, of course, there may be many different consequences of the act of negligence. So what the court is trying to do, what the law is trying to do, is impose within reason some limits on those consequences, which ones are recoverable, which ones aren't. So if you're looking at this from the very fundamental beginnings, that's a good place to start. We've had within reason, now we've got fairly, is the consequence fairly to be regarded as within the risk created by the negligence? That's another good way to put it. Now, these are general non-legal questions, but of course the law trying to do what's reasonable and fair starts with this sort of um, general analysis. We do have a chicken and egg problem with duty of care <clears throat> and scope of duty of care, because while it might be tempting to say, First of all, I'll deal with duty and then I'll deal with damage. What the law tells us is that's just not the right way to do it. And if you look at the second part of that quote, the duty is not a duty to take care in the abstract, but a duty to avoid causing to the particular claimant damage of the particular kind which he has in fact sustained. So we can't look at duty in isolation and damage in isolation. They feed into each other. More specifically, damage feeds into duty. I think that's what makes this area so difficult, because there isn't a simple analysis that one can go through to produce the answer one wants. Look at it from the defendant's point of view. What isn't recoverable? And we'll see in a minute what SAMCO is. It was the South Australia asset management case in 1991, which went to the House of Lords. Defendant is not liable in damages in respect of losses of a kind which fall outside the scope of his duty of care. So that sets the outer parameter. It's losses outside that scope, which aren't going to be recoverable. Of course, that doesn't answer the more difficult question of which losses are within it. 
So do we look upon scope of duty as part of causation? Do we look at it as part of remoteness? What about what we were taught from the textbooks and no doubt in our law courses? Can we apply the normal duty, breach, causation, damage analysis to give us the answer? Well, the answer is yes, but these days that is probably too simplistic, particularly in uh, complex cases, but it is still a very helpful starting point. And if one reads any of the authorities on this area, one sees that what the Supreme Court are keen not to do is to lay down too strict a formula. Of course, tort will throw up all sorts of different sets of facts. And what the court is aiming to do is to produce a mechanism by which we can reach the right answer. And in that sense, it won't be so prescriptive that it's only one way of doing it. So you may have to go back in some cases to those old fashioned questions, duty, breach, causation and damage, and it may give you the answer. But in some cases, as we shall see, it won't. Now let's look at a illustration of a case where I think we can all give a pretty common sense answer to this problem. It's Lord Hoffman's climber's knee, the one referred to in Samco in 1991. Facts are pretty much these. I'm a climber. I want to go climbing in the Alps next week for a week. I've had a few twinges in my knee lately and I'm worried that my knee might not be up to the climbing. So I go to my GP and I say, could you examine my knee please and tell me whether I'm going to be fit to go for a week's climbing next week. GP is in a bit of a hurry, does a rather careless job, gives me the all clear, fails to tell me that I have a badly ruptured ligament. On the strength of that, I go to, to the Alps and I start my climbing holiday. Unfortunately, while I'm there, there's an avalanche. I suffer serious injuries, nothing whatsoever to do with my knee. Now, I think we can all look at that and say, yes, the GP was negligent. Yes, um, it caused the it caused me to go on my climbing holiday. But of course, you could look at that and say, the question to the GP was about the knee. The examination was meant to be the knee. The fact that I've got caught in an avalanche, uh, which has caused me other injuries, is clearly outside the scope of the duty. So I think that sets a very interesting and easy to understand immediate illustration of what is outside the duty. And what it also shows is that the temptingly simple but for test does not work. Again, yes, if the GP had told me I didn't have a knee that was up to climbing, then no doubt uh, I wouldn't have gone climbing, I wouldn't have suffered the injuries. But I don't think anyone would say that the losses consequent on the avalanche and those injuries would come within the GP's scope of duty. So that sets the outer perimeter here, what isn't recoverable, and of course, that set of facts is quite simple and easy to understand. Sadly, life isn't always so simple. And Emma's now going to talk us through the facts of Carmen Meadows so we can see the sort of difficult, more much more complex sets of facts that are thrown up. So Carmen and Meadows ended up going up to the Supreme Court after several appeals. And the basic facts were that the claimant was told by her GP that she did not have, uh, she was not a carrier of the haemophilia gene. And she had been to the GP specifically to get that checked. She ends up having a baby and the baby has haemophilia. The baby also has autism. It wasn't disputed that if the claimant had been told correctly that she was a carrier of haemophilia, she would have tested the fetus when she was pregnant and she would have terminated the baby. But what's interesting is that the autism has nothing to do with haemophilia. The baby happened to have autism, but it's not a condition that is linked to haemophilia. So the issue that the court had to grapple with was whether or not the claimant could recover damages for the additional costs of bringing up a baby who had autism. There was no dispute that she could recover for bringing up a baby with haemophilia. But the question was whether or not the additional autism should be recoverable as well. And we're going to take a quick vote here. Um, those of you who know the answer to Karna Meadows, just put that from your mind and, and vote on what you instinctively would have thought is the answer to this case. So you should have a poll pop up on your computer. Please select A or B, depending on whether or not you think she should only recover for the haemophilia or the haemophilia plus autism.
be fascinating to see what the, the answer is here. I suspect I know what it's going to be, don't you, Anne? I do. I remember there was a lot of talk about this case when it came out. Certainly when it was at the Court of Appeal, at no, the High Court stage, there was a lot of talk about the, the result and, and there were a lot of different opinions. How are we doing on our poll? Okay. Ah, oh, yeah, well, that is interesting. Fascinating. What a lot of good lawyers we must have in our, our audience. Oh, there we are. Fascinating. <laughs> yeah, so we'll look at, we'll come back to this, uh, these figures. So about 22% uh, went with the autism being recoverable. Okay. All right, let's move on. Right. So how do we get to the solution then? So in terms of the solution, what the Supreme Court did when this went up on appeal is they set out a six step guide. It's only a guide, but when the Supreme Court say it's a guide, we probably ought to be doing it. Uh, and this, isn't help, this, this formula is supposed to help us in all negligence cases, not just clean neg, um, not just accountancy cases, which is where this uh, seemed to originate from. So step one is what they catchily called the actionability question. This is really, is there a cause of action here? Is there the right kind of loss or damage that links to the, the breaches and duty that you're alleging? Um, it has to be more than de minimis. Uh, one example that might fall into being a problem in this category is something like plural plaques. So we know that that gives you a condition that doesn't actually cause you an injury necessarily. So until you've got an actual, actual damage, you can't complete the tort of negligence. So that's step one, just checking you have got a, a proper cause of action. Moving on to step two. Now this is the, one of the important new, I say new, it's a very old concept, but it's been re-aired in, in Carna Meadows. So what is the scope of duty? What are the particular risks in this case that the defendant had a duty to guard against? Now, some things we know are, are outside scopes of duty. We know that you don't owe a duty of care to the world of large. We know there are, are strict limits on what secondary victims uh, would come within, uh, you'd, you would owe a duty to. Um, in cases where you're looking at information cases, so you had it where you have a duty to advise, it can be quite easy to work out this question because you normally go to someone for a specific piece of advice and the scope of their duty is no more than what you've gone to them to advise as the usual starting point. Where scope of duty can be a bit more complicated is where the claimant suffers different loss from a breach of one duty. And this, this is links into step five. So steps two and five have to really be taken together, which goes back to James's point that you can't look at duty and damage in isolation. You have to look at them fairly fluidly. Uh, moving on to step three, this is a fairly simple one. Was the duty breached? I think we're all very familiar with that one, so we don't need to go over it in any detail. Step four, factual causation. Historically, we've all adopted the but four test. It's been criticized as being a bit too simple and it doesn't always work, but it's a very good starting point and it works in a lot of cases. The problem that we think has happened historically is people stop at but for. You see it in all sorts of judgments. People just say, well, but for this happening, but for the negligence, I would never have had X, Y, and Z happen to me. And people therefore thought that all X, Y, and Z all linked back to the duty and were all recoverable. And the truth is it's more complicated than that. Going to step five. So this is a step that interplays with step two, the scope of duty. And this is called the duty nexus question. And what you're looking at here really is whether there is a, a sufficient link between the damage you're claiming for and the duty that was owed in the first place. Pretty easy in most personal injury claims to answer. If you've got a duty of care not to hit somebody with your car and they suffer a broken leg because you've hit them with your car, the two are pretty linked but it gets more complicated in other scenarios. Um, and what the court has suggested, and, and this comes out of the Samco case, which is, is not new, is the counterfactual. And this is a, a test you can apply as a, a check really to, to see if, if you've got it right. Um, 
it sounds quite scary, but once you get the hang of it, it's fine. It, and it really applies to information or, or cases where you're advising the breaches of failure to advise properly. It doesn't work so well with certain other cases. Um, and what you do with the, ca the counterfactual is you pretend that the negligent piece of advice was actually correct. Not that the negligent piece of advice was never given, but that it was actually correct. Uh, and I think James will talk to you a bit more about that with the mountaineer's knee later on in the talk. So the final step, and again, one which I think historically has been overlooked by people is what we'd have thought of previously as legal causation. Is there a novus actus or valenti or contributory negligence that comes into play? Is the injury too, force, too remote, not foreseeable? And really, what is the, the actual cause of the loss? And this, I think there's a link between scope of duty, step two and step five, and a little bit of step six. You have to sometimes be a bit holistic in your approach to how you view, view those in practice. Um, this is a six step process set out by the Supreme Court. We think, Emma, don't we, that textbooks are going to have to be a little bit revised to take this into account now. We have a seven judge court, five of whom backed this six step approach. The other two were a little bit awkward. One of them, I think, did his own eight step approach, but this is the majority. So I think we can expect now that in any case, except for the most simple cases, as we'll see in a minute, we're going to have to go through this six step process, aren't we? I think so. I think all my advisors are going to have to change their structure to yeah. adopt this uh, this formula. Yeah. Well, I was the one who chose the word algorithm. And you do wonder, don't you, that if the Supreme Court had come carry on in this vein and start giving us strict tests and lists of considerations and so on, we are going to be replaced by AI in the end, aren't we? If we have bright people in the Supreme Court and bright people writing software, we're going to be out of a job, aren't we? <laughs> I hope not. Yeah. OK. So let's run some examples through those six steps and to make it as simple as possible. Let's take the RTA, the basic RTA, where Emma goes, goes out on her bike tomorrow um, to cycle to the shops. I go out in my car and I knock her off. She suffers a broken arm. She had a good brief in the diary for Monday. She can't do that anymore. That's got to be returned. So she loses those earnings. And her, her delightful husband, Lee, is going to have to care for her a few days in her um, <clears throat> daily life. So let's run that set of facts through the through the six tests. Actionability must be the right kind of loss or damage. Well, we all know the answer to that one. The broken arm and the consequential losses and the care and so on are absolutely more than de minimis. Uh, and they're just the sort of losses. So that's a tick. Scope of duty. Again, very simple in the simplest sort of case. Is it within the scope of my duty as the driver? to protect against the risks of harm to Emma as she rides her bike? And the answer is clearly yes. So again, we can see that this six step, step process works quickly and easily with the simplest cases. Has there been a breach? Yes, I was careless. Factual causation, but for do the job for, for us here, won't it? Because but for my negligence, she wouldn't have suffered those injuries. Duty nexus, is there a sufficient nexus between a particular element, particular element of the harm? Well, we've seen the harm, it's the broken arm, the lost earnings and the care. So again, as it says in the second bullet point there, easy to answer in a case like this. Legal responsibility, well, this, at this point you would come in with, let's say she wasn't looking where she was going, she was uh, looking at her phone as she rides along on her bike, that might be contributory negligence. So you can see how the analysis works, but let's just tweak the facts slightly and see how it works in the slightly more difficult case involving Emma on her bike. Let's say she was off to the uh, betting shop and she was going to put £10 on a 50 to 1 outsider at Haydock um, at for the 5.30 race that day. I knock her off. She can't go to the betting shop. She can prove to the judge that she had the £10 on her, that she had the name of the horse on her that she was going to the betting shop and that the horse won. She's lost £500. Now, where in the analysis does that £500 come? Because my suspicion is that the judge isn't going to award that. What do you think, Emma? I think it's difficult to know whether it comes under step five or step six or both, because looking at my, my old fashioned principles of, of how we approach these things, I'd be thinking it might be a, a, a loss that's too remote. Um, but then also when you look at step five, is it sufficiently linked? Is my loss on betting on horses sufficiently linked to your duty not to hit me with a car on my bike? That it feels like there might be two channels of argument that you could attack here. Yeah. 
Well, I suppose it, it's a financial loss. It's no different in basic, most the broadest terms from your loss of earnings. It's just that it doesn't feel quite right awarding it. So and my guess is it actually comes in, in under six, but I can see the argument under five. So perhaps even the simplest cases uh, can't be resolved quite so easily. Right, let's go back to Khan and Meadows then and see if we can run the facts of Khan and Meadows through the steps. Actionability. Well, this is this lady has given birth to a child which has haemophilia and autism. Those additional costs over and above the cost of raising uh, a healthy child, yes, they're recoverable. We know that the law has established that. That's a tick. Scope of duty. Now, that's a much trickier one, isn't it? Because uh, which of the losses, the autism losses and the haemophilia losses, should we say are within the scope of duty, which, of course, is the fundamental question? Well, actually, if you go to the decision here, all seven members of the Supreme Court found this quite simple to answer. The way they looked at it was to say, Mrs. Meadows went to the GP to ask about haemophilia. She didn't ask about autism. She could prove that if she'd been told she was a carrier of the gene, she'd have had the fetus tested and sadly she would have terminated. But on that basis, does one need to go much further? It's within the scope of duty, isn't it? So the Supreme Court said, actually, because this was a haemophilia inquiry and that was the duty on the doctor, it's within scope of duty. And we'll see how step five comes in in a minute. Breach, yes, there was a breach. The GP simply got it wrong and gave her the results of effectively the wrong inquiry. Factual causation. Well, that's made out too, isn't it? Because she could show that she would have um, terminated the baby. So, uh, but for the bad advice, she wouldn't have had a baby at all. So factual causation is made out. So that would be made then, out. So that'd be made out for both the haemophilia and the autism. Absolutely, it would be made out for both. So it doesn't help us to dis dis distinguish between the two, which is why we come to the duty nexus. Now, We've already mentioned that under scope of duty step two, that the answer seems to be fairly simple here, but we can check it. And this is where duty nexus comes in because we'll consider the two sets of losses separately. Remember the haemophilia was 1.4 million pounds and the autism losses were 7.6 million pounds. Haemophilia losses. Let's look at the basic facts. She did not want a baby with haemophilia. She sought information about the risk of haemophilia. If she'd been properly informed about the risk of haemophilia, she would not have had the baby. So, as we've already said, that looks like a tick. Those are going to be recoverable, aren't they? Autism losses. Now, this is the SAMCO counterfactual. And the important thing to remember here is that it's a cross-check. So we think we've already established the answer under step two. The counterfactual. Now, the, the, the mistake one could easily make here is to say, let's apply a counterfactual where the GP got it right. That's not the counterfactual. The counterfactual is considering what would have happened had the information been true. In other words, if the GP had correctly told her she was not a carrier of the haemophilia gene, well, the answer is she would still then have had the baby and it would have had the same chance of autism. So you can see on that analysis that those losses fall outside the scope of the duty because they are not in the sense of the uh, nexus sufficiently linked to the breach of duty. Emma, are you happy with that analysis? Yes, and I, I think it's, it, when the court explains it, it seems so simple, and yet none of the sort of high court, the high court judge didn't get it, uh, yes. get it right in that sense, but if your duty to advise is about haemophilia, the only damage that would be linked to that is haemophilia. Yes, but for it has caused other things. And you know, maybe you wouldn't have crossed a road when you did and wouldn't have been hit by a car, but that's all very far down the line. Um, but they, I think the court's judgment's really good at just bringing it back to, that's what you owed the duty for. And this is a related damage. You don't get every single piece of damage that has flowed on a but for result. And a really interesting part of Lord Burroughs' speech, he was one who dissented, not in the outcome, but in the six step analysis. He pointed out that um, if the judge at first instance had got it right, had been right, if her approach had been right, in other words, to give the nine million pounds, if this baby had been born by chance without haemophilia, but with autism, you'd have had to give it the 7.6 million pounds for autism, because we are then effectively back in the knee, aren't we, with the climber's knee, because even though 
autism had nothing to do with the original advice and the examination, so on the information given to Mrs. Meadows, on a simple but for basis, wouldn't have had the baby, wouldn't have had an autistic baby, and therefore autism, loss, autism losses would have been recoverable. So that's a really interesting, I think, and uh, obvious way of looking at it, in that um, the haemophilia and the autism losses uh, can't be taken together as the first instance judge did. It was simply wrong to do it. Step six, the legal responsibility question. Well, again, that's easily answered here. So everybody should, in our poll, should pat themselves on the back because the result was that the damages that were recoverable were limited to the 1.4 million pounds. So let's look at that in the context of what Lord Denning said. Um, is that a reasoned outcome? Yes, I think it certainly is. Is it fair? Well, I think that's more debatable, but, um, and you can certainly see why a first instance judge might tend towards having, I'm not saying that um, Mrs. Justice yet did this, but having sympathy for the mother and approaching it on that basis. But the, the fact is the Supreme Court are there not to be popular, but to be right. And much as the outcome here was to Mrs. Meadows' disadvantage, it was right, wasn't it, Emma? Yes. Absolutely. Um, I, when you go back to the point of scope of duty and the point of compensation, you're compensating for the risk you created, not every risk that flows as a result, not just the bad luck risks that life throws at you. OK, so let's just stand back a bit and look when we might apply that step five nexus cross check. I think it's right to say probably that it only applies in those, well, I say only, I'll probably be proved wrong immediately, but an information or decision case where the information has been handed over. So it's the climber's knee or it is Mrs. Meadows or it's an accountant giving them or a, a valuer giving the valuation of a property and so on. So I think it only works in those cases. But I think it's most useful where it's, not so much whether any loss is recoverable at all, but it's different types of loss and whether they're going to be recoverable. And we've seen how in Calm and Meadows, if you go through the stick stage process, you come out, I think, with a pretty firm conclusion that she should recover the haemophilia losses, but not the autism. So it's, it's those sorts of cases where the counterfactual is going to be useful and used as a cross check. But as I say, don't treat that as an exhaustive list because there will be other facts um, which no doubt will prove that it's broader than that. Although we're going to look at Chester and Afshar in a minute. And Emma and I have spent some time thinking about whether you could apply a counterfactual step five nexus analysis in that's Chester and Afshar. And we don't think you can do it, but we'll come to that. So over to you, Emma, for a couple more worked examples. Thanks, James. So first of all, Parkinson and NHS. This was a a, a negligently performed sterilization. The doctor failed to properly sterilize the claimant. And as a result, she got pregnant with her fifth child. Um, and the child was born with some congenital abnormalities. So we go through our six stages. Actionability. Is there a cause of action? Is there loss and damage that, that all gives you the, the building blocks of a case? Yes, there is. Um, we know we can't recover for a healthy child, even if you didn't want that child, but you can recover for any additional costs if the child is born with disabilities. So number two, we look at scope of the duty. Your scope of duty when performing a sterilization is to properly perform a sterilization, stop her getting pregnant again. So that in, it would be my analysis of what the scope of the duty owed was. Did the doctor breach it? Yes, that one's simple. Factual causation, the but for test, but for the failed operation, she would not have fallen pregnant. There would have been no baby. There would have been no costs incurred with, with the, well, the baby at all, but certainly with the uh, congenital abnormalities. So step five, our duty nexus. Is there a link between the harm, the injury that we're seeking compensation for and the duty owed? Yes, the cost of bringing up a child with this condition links to the duty. Now the duty wasn't to prevent a child with congenital abnormalities being born per se, it was to prevent any baby being born and if it happens to have had uh, certain conditions that are going to make it a disability and are going to cost more that all links that all flows because there should not have been a baby in the first place uh, so then legal causation is this too remote no it's perfectly foreseeable that you're going that any baby carries that sort of risk um 
uh, is it the, is the failed sterilization the effective cause? Yes, there would be no baby. So you can see how on a case like Parkinson, the, st the six stages work. Likewise, Groom and Selby, another baby case slightly different um, in that the GP failed to diagnose that the claimant was pregnant. So the failure comes once the baby is already there rather than um, shouldn't have got pregnant at all. But the claimant lost the chance to have a, a termination, which she would have had if she had been told. The baby was then born prematurely and then four weeks later suffered from meningitis. Now, there was an interesting point here, which fits into, uh, into the six stage step. I think in number one, step one, you know, we mentioned the plural plaques earlier. The Court of Appeal found that although the meningitis came on four weeks later, the baby was not actually born healthy because the bacteria that they to cause the meningitis was already present on the baby's skin. Now, I probably want to have a look at that in detail to make sure that there was that this wasn't a, a plural plaques type case where you have a condition brewing or sort of under the surface, you've got the potential for a condition, but no actual damage is yet caused. Um, so I think re reading through this case, it would be step one of the six, which would cause me to look in, in some detail. Uh, but they found that, that the bacteria, that the, there was an injury caused, and so it all flowed. But the rest of the six steps would all make perfect sense again with Groom and Selby. Yeah, I think just to look at step two again in a slightly broader context, I think it's possible here to distinguish between medical cases, clinical cases and other cases. If I go to see my solicitor for advice on my will, I don't expect my solicitor to start asking me about uh, my financial investments and pensions and so on. Um, it tends to be fairly well circumscribed, as Emma said earlier, the, the advice that's being sought. Whereas with a doctor, of course, you could easily go to see your doctor about one thing. Uh, and it may well be that the doctor's duty is broader than that on a general examination of the patient or whatever. And it may be something that the that maybe the doctor has missed something that the doctor should have spotted. So I, I think while Kahn and Meadows in these two cases uh, provide a, a very good analysis of stage two, I think, or step two, I think it is going to be more difficult in some cases. And as what we must emphasize here is all of these cases are incredibly fact specific. All sorts of new facts can come out, which can confound what looks like a simple algorithm to decide these things. But certainly in clinical cases, and this is a point that um, Lord Leggett made in the Supreme Court, uh, one is not going to be up very often faced with a doctor whose duty is so closely circumscribed. So uh, that's another interesting point, I think. I think one of the areas that springs to mind that that could really come up and would be pregnancy cases, because if you're pregnant and you go and see your doctor or, or your midwife about ailment X in your pregnancy, they will almost always ask you, by the way, are you taking your folic acid? Yes. Are you doing this? They, they have certain checks that I, I suspect they are meant to ask at every, every opportunity they see you, regardless of why you've turned up. Now, if I turned up for a broken leg whilst I was pregnant, that might not trigger, trigger it. But if I was there for a maternity-related consultancy consultation, it, it might be that they still have other things that they are obliged to mention. And of course, once you've broadened the duty beyond the immediate scope of the inquiry, that the patient came along for, you may open the way to all sorts of other heads of loss. So it, one doesn't want to be too restrictive in the way one analyzes it. Anyway, I think you've taken on the unenviable task of discussing mm. Lester and Afshar, haven't you, Emma? Yes, uh, it still makes no sense, is the, the headline. So Chester and Afshar, in that case, the doctor failed to warn the claimant of a very small, uh, non-negligent risk that, um, of paralysis in her surgery. It was about a one or two percent risk. Uh, now, interestingly, in this case, and the judge did himself no favours and caused this whole mess. The, he, the judge said the claimant was unable to show that she would have refused surgery if properly advised. So but for the negligent advice, would she have had the surgery or not? And the judge said, I just don't know. Um, so the burden's on the claimant to prove that she wouldn't have had the surgery and she failed to do that. So on step four, factual causation, she fails on this case. And it's one of those annoying old judgments where everybody in the House of Lords gave an opinion and it's very hard to work out what the end actual decision is and, and what the ratio is. But my reading of it is that they accepted the judges that the claimant had failed to prove factual causation. And then they said, 
but we're just going to make up a policy decision to allow her to recover nonetheless. What I find is often, mis I find this case is often misquoted and people think that you can get over but for causation, factual causation, by saying, well, I would have had the surgery later. And at that point I would have faced the same one to 2% risk. So on balance, that risk would not have eventuated. Therefore I prove factual causation. If you go back and read this case, it doesn't say that. It accepts that you fail the but for causation test. It just takes this um, slightly unprecedented and possibly outside their powers step of making up some law to do what they think was fair. Um, and it's it's a case, isn't it, where there was another easy to remember Lord Hoffman analogy. It was the person who goes into the casino to put all their money on red 23 on the roulette wheel, isn't told that they only have a one in 38 chance of winning, complains, uh, but says, oh, if I'd been told I only had a one in 38 chance, I'd have gone to a different casino on a different day, where, of course, as Lord Hoffman points out, your odds would be just as bad, exactly the same. So again, you'd fail to make out any causative loss on the basis of not being told you had a one in 38 chance. So again, that's a nice, that's a bit like the climber's knee. It's a nice little way of understanding that and not being drawn into the tempting route by which one arrives at um, success for the claimant, which is to say, well, I only had a very low chance of this paralysis. So if I'd had the operation on a different day in a different hospital, the probability is I wouldn't have been paralyzed, but that isn't the right analysis, is it? No, and it's, even if they managed to establish that in but for causation or on the example I gave of saying I would have had it later, therefore on balance I wouldn't have suffered it, I think that would undermine their argument in, under step six, the legal causation one, because the effective cause of that injury is nothing to do with the, um, the failure by the expert to tell them about the risk, because it hasn't changed their risks of suffering the injury. Uh, it hasn't you know, delayed them having an operation and they're deteriorating in the meantime. The risks faced are exactly the same. So there is, I think, no, on number six, I don't think that there is an effective cause link. So even if they got through step four, their own arguments would um, undermine them on step six. Uh, so it, Chester still makes no sense. And someone please appeal it. Please it's run a policy, case. It's policy, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It's, it's policy, but you can't see the attraction of saying, well, um, Mr. Afshar, I used to know Mr. Afshar, he was quite a um, frequently used expert in neurosurgery cases, he was a nice chap and he was good, but on that occasion he didn't tell her about the risk and he should have done, so you can see the temptation to say that the policy should allow her to recover, but uh, it is a very difficult decision to explain. It undermines all the principles of negligence, you've got to have damage caused and no damage is caused in that case. So I, yeah. I, I think if it went back up to the Supreme Court, I would hope that they would fix it. It's always a worry to me when Lord Hoffman dissents, because if you want a judge who takes a principled approach, he's your judge. Anyway, we've had uh, an inquiry. Emma, I'm going to read it out to you. Um, I say an inquiry. It's a, a question. And it is this. Um, outside the medical clinical negligence com uh, context, if a defendant had a statutory duty to protect the public against a specific event, in this case a fire, occurring because of a specific risk, in this case an accidental leakage of flammable substances, and the defendant is in breach of those regulations, but the event occurs, but because of a completely different risk, that the regulations were not designed to protect, in this case the intervention of a third party, does Carmen Meadows help us to answer that question. Should, the, should there be a recovery? So let's just look at that again. The defendant has a statutory duty to prevent fire through um, escape of uh, flammable substances. It, the defendant is in breach. A fire occurs, but for a different reason. I think the answer to that is actually quite simple, isn't it? I think so. I just want to check that the, they may have breached some of their storage obligations but that hasn't actually led to the chemicals leaking out the leak is purely somebody else coming along committing a cr criminal act and um and and there being a leak of the chemicals is, is that your understanding james well i think so yeah i think we have two we have a very distinctive um we have a separation here between the fire against which the statutory duty guarded with the fire as actually caused and i think in that case we don't make out even any factual causation in order to 
compensate someone for one stat breach of statutory duty, one has to have committed a breach of statutory duty that has at least caused the damage, don't, don't we? Yes, I mean, I do remember there were the old fire in the uh, in the factory cases, which looked at the criminal acts coming in, and I, yeah. I would have to remind myself what they, what well, they that, found that, exactly. Uh, yeah, but I think, to be fair to my question, um, the questioner wants us to leave out the relevance of intervening criminal acts of third party. This is more, right. I think... Um, Purely on our, our six-stage test, Yeah, the damage cause has... Well, it had nothing to do with the breach, as far as I can see. Doesn't look like causation gets to first base, does it? Mm. No. OK, well, I, uh, not bad, 41 minutes. That's um, two times, what was it, 18 minutes. I hope people didn't fall asleep five minutes ago. But um, And my internet managed to last, so that's And your good. internet lasted. <laughs> so thank you very much, everybody, for listening, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.